Thanks, Jim, for that reading. Yeah, let's go ahead and go to, uh, if you haven't turned there already, into that text of Revelation 3. We have been uh, working through uh, this series, the seven-letter series, and uh, uh, yeah, we come to the, the last one, and this is maybe, maybe the most famous, I don't know, um, Ephesus is up there as well, but uh, this is one that a lot of people talk about. There's some really vivid imagery that we just read there. Um, and so, uh, let me give you some background of the city, uh, just to remind you uh, where we're at on the map here. We've, we've gone all the way around in Patmos here, where John is in exile. We've gone all the way around the postal route here, and now we end at Laodicea there. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of background. I found some uh, video again online. It's just a short, about a one-minute clip here. So, I'll, I'll hit play here on that here in a second. You can just watch some of uh, the uh, what you're going to see is you're going to see some of the ruins that if you were to go to Laodicea today in Turkey, you would find some of these ruins uh, today. So you, you'll see a little about that while I give some, uh, some background information uh, of the city here. So you'll see that there's a lot of different archaeological things. There was a very wealthy city. There was a city that had lots and lots of money. It was, not, uh, it was built on a roadway rather than around natural resources. Uh, so there were some things that other cities would have had that this city did not have. And so you'll see some pipes and things like that, aqueducts. Uh, they, they weren't any anywhere near any natural water supply, and so they had to pipe this all in, and it was a, kind of a, a, an amazing feat. But they were uh, extraordinarily wealthy, uh, like Sardis in Philadelphia. It was uh, prone to earthquakes. In fact, in 60 AD, there was an earthquake that happened that leveled the entire city. Um, you know, in this area, there's, there's the, the being prone to, to earthquakes. It was known for its banking industry, medical schools. They specialized in eye care. And there was also uh, this rich wool that was black in color that was uh, cultivated in that region. And, and they would uh, export this. And uh, it was one of the places where, they, again, that there was lots and lots of money in this city here. And so, uh, and you, these themes that I'm, I'm bring, bringing up from the background, you're, gonna, you're probably already making some connections into the text already of why Jesus said what he said about the city. But this is kind of what, what, what we know about the city. And I uh, had lots of temples, of course, and um, uh, polytheistic in nature. And uh, it was, again, a very, very wealthy, wealthy city. Uh, very self-sufficient in many ways, and we're going to give some illustrations of why that is. So, what is it that I'd like us to, to walk away from this sermon today, okay? What, what, what would be the thesis, if you will, of the sermon? And that would be this, this is what we can learn from the church at Laodicea is this. Self-sufficiency is a self-destructive pursuit, okay? Self-sufficiency is a self-destructive pursuit, Okay? Now, this is, this is really difficult to, to preach because so, I'm someone who likes to be self-sufficient. I'm like, I like independence, okay? I, I like to prove that I can handle things. And I, and I dare say I'm probably not the only one that is like that in this room here today. But as we look at this lesson from Laodicea, and of course, I'm not talking about every aspect of independence and every aspect of self-sufficiency, but in the main of what this attitude and this pursuit it really is a self-destructing pursuit to pursue self-sufficiency, and I think that's what we can best learn from this church. So we're going to unpack that by looking at a harsh reality, a harmful delusion, and then some healthy assurances from Jesus himself. Let me pause and ask God's blessing on our sermon, and uh, then we'll jump back in. Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to look at this text, and I pray that I would be... Um, uh, led by your spirit as I communicate uh, um, uh, this text and this, and I pray that I would be someone who is led by your spirit. And God, we need your spirit to guide this time, uh, whether we're listening or speaking, we, we need your spirit to guide us. And so God, I, I pray that we would not be uh, distracted. And I know that I'm, I feel like I'm dealing with a lot of mental distractions right now. And I pray that I would be able to, to set these things aside and, 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 and focus on, on the text here and on what you have for us. And, 
And so, God, I just pray that what, when we're said and done, uh, that we would have a better understanding of, of, of how great you are and what you've done for us and our responsibility towards you. I pray that we would not uh, shirk those responsibilities. I pray that we would embrace them, knowing that empowered by Jesus Christ, we can honor you and, and uh, bring glory to your name. And so this is what we're praying for in this hour, and we pray that it would be a time well spent together. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. So self-sufficiency is a self-destructive pursuit. We're going to look about this, first of all, with a, a harsh reality. There's a, a harsh reality that Jesus gives to the Laodiceans here in verse 15. And after he gives his introduction of, of calling himself the words of the amen and the faithful and, and, and true witness, the beginning of God's creation, we may come back to that here in just a few minutes here. But he says in verse 15, I, I know your works, that you're neither hot or cold, uh, that he says that, would you be either cold or hot? And he talks about them being lukewarm. And so what's the reality here? What, what, is, what is he getting at here with this imagery of cold water and hot water and lukewarm water and even spitting things out of his mouth? What, what is he talking about here? Well, the harsh reality is, is that he was basically saying that they had grown to become useless to God. That, that's really what he's getting at here, is that what they had embraced and, and how that they had been living, it, they had gotten to the point where this church in Laodicea, and there was people there that he says that I love like, later on, and we're going to see it. So he has a, a love for the city but, but he, in this church, but he's telling them the hard truth. He says, essentially, you have become useless to me. Now, now, now how am I making that leap? Now, how am I getting there that that's what Jesus is saying, that, okay, they're useless. So he's talking about water temperature. But why is it that I'm getting to the point of uselessness there? How do I get there? Well, it's by the fact that Jesus spits them out of his mouth, he says. Okay? He doesn't want them because it's not useful to him. And it's the imagery of, that leads me to understand this usefulness. Let me explain. You see, I mentioned earlier that the city of Laodicea was, was made around a, a roadway, okay, where commerce and people were traveling. They decided this would be a, a great place for a city. Now, the problem was is that there really weren't any natural resources in this city. So, i.e., there was no water, there was no water supply. And so what they had to do is that they had to pipe in their water through aqueducts and things like that from different cities. So Hierapolis was, was to the north, and so they had to get water from there. Then Colossae was uh, 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 to the south, and they had to bring water from there. Now you say, well, why did they have to bring both? Well, you see, in, in Hierapolis, if you go there to this day, there's these hot springs there. It's known for this, and people go there to these hot springs there in Hierapolis, and so they go, and they felt that at this time, they felt that it had healing powers and things like that. So people would go to the hot springs of Hierapolis. Now, what they would do is they, would, they needed water in Laodicea, so they would build these pipes out of clay, and, and you can see some of these in archaeology when the, they, were, they were built up with uh, deposits and things like that, so we know how old they were, and, and, and it's, just, it's an incredible architecture. Uh, uh, architectural feat that to bring this water in. And so they were bringing the water from the hot springs all the way over to Laodicea. Well, the problem is, is that by the time the water got there, that it was not hot anymore, okay? It was lukewarm. It's kind of like the really long shower you take, and so you're in the shower, and you're enjoying this really hot shower, and then you know that the water tank must be getting empty because you were the third person to take the shower. Or all of a sudden, it's getting less and less hot, right? Okay, lukewarm is getting cold. So it, it's not as good anymore. And so, so it had the sense of the, when the water got the, to Laodicea, it was, it was full, so full of deposits from the transport, and, and it, it really, by itself, naturally, it, it wasn't good at all. It couldn't use it. On the other hand, they were bringing in the cold water from Colossae. They were bringing that in because that was known for its nice freshwater cold springs. And so they were bringing that in uh, through pipes and aqueducts and things like that as well. But you can imagine the same thing was happening is by the time the water got to Laodicea, it wasn't cold anymore. It wasn't 
it wasn't refreshing anymore. It was lukewarm, okay? And so some people have looked at this text and said, okay, God wants you either hot on fire for him, or he would rather, if you're not hot on fire, and be cold. You know, don't be lukewarm in the middle here or something like that. You know, you either be cold or hot. That's not what he's getting at here, talking about being on fire for God or being cold and indifferent towards him. That's not what he's contrasting here. He's talking about usefulness here. He's saying the hot springs, that was useful for medicine, and that was useful for comfort. The coldness was useful for refreshment, but when they got there, it was lukewarm, and no one wants to drink this. In fact, because of all the deposits and things like that, it was actually, uh, uh, naturally, uh, it would induce vomiting, and so you had to clean it and boil it and all this stuff and get it, and it was a lot of work. That's the picture that he's communicating here when he says, it's it is useless, okay? The water naturally, before we do anything, is useless here. And so when we take that imagery, when you look at this illustration he's using here, he says, because you're lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And so it's possible, as we apply this point, it is possible then uh, uh, to lose any usefulness to God. It's not that He needs us, but that He wants to use us. But they had gone, gotten to the place where they were essentially, Jesus was saying, I don't have any use for you because of how you're living, because of what you're doing. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth because it's useless to me. The, the church has become useless to me. Now, again, it's not that Jesus' plan is going to be thwarted because of this. That's not the point. The point isn't that Jesus is like, now what's going to happen? You're useless to me. Th that's not the point of our usefulness to God. It's not that we have to be a certain way in order for God to accomplish His overarching purpose. It's whether or not we are going to be obedient to God and that God is going to use us and have that fellowship and that blessing. And yes, there are things that do... Uh, is a result, a, a negative result of our disobedience. But what Jesus here is saying, he's saying, I want to use this church, but it's useless to me because of your lukewarmness. So how do they get to this point? How, why were they useless? Well, that leads us to our second point, and that is that they, uh, the harmful delusion of the, Laodice the, the Laodiceans. Okay, so we had this, this harsh reality that Jesus had to say, listen, I, I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news here, but you're really useless here. And the illustration he uses with that with the lukewarm water. But how, why? It was because they were under this delusion here. And what is the delusion? Well, if you're paying attention to the thesis, you kind of know where this is going, right? They thought they were self-sufficient. How do I get that? Look at the text again, verse 17. For you say, I am rich. So that word for there is, is, is connecting it back, and he's saying, okay, you're lukewarm. I'll spit you out of my mouth. And then he's explaining why. Because or for you say, verse 17, I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked here. They, they thought that they were self-sufficient. They said, I'm rich. I need nothing. I have prospered. I mentioned before that this place was prone to earthquakes, right? 80, 70, 60, right? That there was this time where it was uh, destroyed. Now, remember, there was a couple other cities that looked at, Sardis and Philadelphia, that were also destroyed by earthquakes, and those were in AD 17. Now, I don't know if you remember, in those two sermons, I mentioned in both of those situations, the governor, the, 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 the emperor, uh, the Roman emperor, he gave them help in rebuilding, help to rebuild Sardis, help rebuild, uh, rebuild Philadelphia. Remember last week we said that Philadelphia was so thankful and so felt that they were indebted to this emperor that they temporarily changed their name to honor the emperor, right? Okay, And so they, they, the emperor uh, gave money for rebuilding. The emperor told both Sardis and Philadelphia that they didn't have to pay taxes for five years in order to get rebuilt and get reestablished. So it makes sense that then, that the governor would do the same thing for Laodicea, right? But he didn't. And the reason why is because they said, we don't need your money. You see, Laodiceans, they said, we're going to rebuild ourselves. We're going to rebuild our entire city all, about, all, all on our own. In fact, there's a Roman historian, Tacitus, Tac Tacitus, who said this, one of the famous cities of Asia, Laodicea, was that same year overthrown by an earthquake and without any relief from us, recovered itself by its own resources. And so 
it was by their own resources that they were able to rebuild their entire city without any help at all from the Roman government. And that's a pretty good thing, right? And so they were self-sufficient there, but they had got to the point where it was a point of pride. It was a point of, I'm not going to ask for help. We're not going to be dependent upon anyone else. And this was one example of that. Uh, you know, it's also interesting when uh, he talks about here uh, how that they were poor, but in actuality, they're poor, blind, and naked. So they were known for the riches, but one of the other things that they were known for was the medical community, the, 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 their medical advancements in the medical community. They were a leader in ancient medicine. In fact, they had developed this, this eye ointment that was helping with eye disease during that time. And so they were known for this. In fact, they would sell this, and that was one of the ways they got the riches, is that they would sell this all over the, the Roman Empire about this, this ointment that was supposedly helped with eye diseases. And it was sold throughout the whole Greco-Roman world, as I said. And so they got this riches. Now, it's interesting that here they say, um, he says, um, you say you're rich, you have prospered, you need nothing, not realizing that you're poor going after the riches and blind here going after their idea of their uh, medical advancements. But then there was another thing. Is they, not only were they very rich and wealthy, but they were a leader in ancient medicine. But then they also, as I mentioned in the introduction, that they specialized in producing this soft black wool used to make expensive clothing and rugs. And so this was another way they gained their wealth is that they had this, 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 this wool that they used to make these, these rugs and clothing that was very expensive. And it was a sign of, of, luxury, uh, of luxury to have uh, garments and, and rugs and tapestries made from this black wool wool from Laodicea. And so it's interesting when Jesus looks at this, he says, not realizing you say you're, you're rich and prosperous, you need nothing, not realizing that you're poor and blind. And then what else does he say here? Naked, right? And so he's getting at all of their areas of self-sufficiency. And it's very practical. It's very economic. It's very uh, 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 um, a community oriented. He's saying, you're saying that you're self-sufficient. You're saying that you don't need anything because you are strong here and you have this going for you and this is the advancement that you are responsible for. But don't you realize that you are poor, blind, and naked spiritually is what he's saying. And so this whole idea of this, this, this pursuing self-sufficiency is self-destructive because it renders us useless in God's economy here. And so the question we would have to ask ourselves is, how is it that we are deluded? How is it that we would be a people who would be going after self-sufficiency? How is it that, what is it that we're looking for in our life? Or what is it that we look to in our life? And maybe it's maybe it's that we're we're good with 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 our with our money or good with or we're talented in some way or or maybe we have leadership abilities and so we are a, a good leader at work or or maybe you're just extraordinarily organized. I mean the house is in order and you have everything in a box and everything's ready to go. And some of you're like, oh, that's not my house. But the point is, is that maybe some of you are that way. And then that's our source of self sufficiency. That's our source of identity. That's our source of okay. I'm checking the boxes. I'm doing well because of this and, and of making wise decisions there. Now, again, nothing's wrong with any of those things, right? And that's the point. There's nothing wrong with being wise with finances or being a good leader or being organized or there's nothing wrong with those. Just like there was nothing wrong with producing black garments, black wool garments, and there's nothing wrong with helping the medical community with uh, this eye ointment or there's nothing wrong with, with wanting to rebuild uh, on your own. There's nothing wrong with those on yourself, uh, uh, in and by itself. But when we look to those, as apparently the Laodiceans were, when we look to those as proof of our worthiness, as proof of this idea of, okay, I've got it together, or that's what we're resting on, Jesus says, at that point, you're useless. Because I need people not depending on themselves, I need people dependent on me. How do I know that? Well, that brings us to this uh, 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 healthy assurances from Jesus that we see here in um, uh, verses 18 through 22. He says here, he says, I counsel you to buy. So he says, you don't realize that you're poor, blind, and naked. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. Notice the, the contrast. Notice how he keeps bringing this up. And white garments so that you may clothe yourselves. 
And the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And the salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Do you see how he's going to all of these areas that they were known for? He says, I counsel you to buy from me from this. He says, he says this is, this is what I, basically what he's saying here. He's saying, I am what you need. This is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I, I, I'm counseling you to do this. Now, again, we need to stop and think about who's doing the counseling here. It, this is someone that we should listen to. So Jesus himself says, okay, let me give you some advice. We should stop everything. Pay, take out our pen and paper and write this down, right? Write in black, underline in red. This is exactly what Jesus is saying. When he says, I counsel you to do this, we should sit up, pay attention, and say this is what we should be doing here. And so he says, you need to buy from me. Now, that may cause some of you to think, wait a minute here. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I thought, I thought grace was free. I thought this was a gift given. Isn't that what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2? It's not of works, so say man should boast. It's grace because, you know, uh, uh, it's a free gift. What is he saying here now? Jesus is introducing this by language here. What's, what, what, how, where, how does this mesh here? Well, you've got to understand what Jesus is doing here. He's using the industrial language that they were most familiar with. He's saying, don't go buying from them. Don't, don't do your markets here. You, you come to me. I tell you what, you buy from me, okay? He's not saying that there's actual financial transactions or something that needs to take place, but he's saying, don't go to that marketplace, come to this marketplace. So he's just using the terminology that would have resonated with them when he's saying that. He's saying, don't buy from anywhere else, you come to me. And what he's actually doing here, he's emphasizing the insufficiency of their material riches here. I, I, I'm reminded of Isaiah 55, verse 1. Isaiah 55, verse 1 says this, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. And so what he's basically saying, he's saying again there, he's saying, God is the one that we come to, and you don't need money to buy from me. You don't need money uh, to, to get what you need. And this is what Jesus is saying here. He says, I counsel you. You come and buy from me. You, you don't go to the marketplace thinking that whatever financial transaction is going to elevate you or make you wise enough that then God is going to be impressed with you. you don't, don't think that because you're going to have all the ducks in a row over here or, or, or even the, the, the advancements of, okay, we have uh, 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 of conquered this disease, okay, and so now, now this is our self-sufficiency. You know, one of the things I think about and I, I may step into it here a little bit, but with this whole virus thing that's going on with the pandemic, one of the things I think that it has, we have not talked about enough, and I'll take the full responsibility for this, that I should be talking more about this, is that I think one of the lessons that we're supposed to be learning in this is that a virus is outside of our control, and we need to bow before a sovereign God, and we need to pray to a sovereign God instead of trying to come up with every means of, uh, of mitigating everything about this thing. Now, should we do the vaccines, and should we do all the masking and things like that? You know what? Most likely, yes, in most circumstances. Okay, that's not my point. My point isn't to say, okay, we need to get rid of everything. That's not my point, and, and, and to, to, to start that debate right here. What I am saying is what we're missing, though, is I wonder if sometimes we're inching, if not as a society for sure, if not even in our, in our home here, is are we inching closer to the Laodicean thing of saying, hey, we can deal with this. We can mitigate this. So all this stuff. I think most of us at this point, all of us, we're kind of like, no, we can't. But we've got to go back to this idea of we need to go to Jesus. And we need to say, you're the one who can handle this, okay? He said, it's medicine here he's talking about here. He's not saying medicine's bad, and I'm not saying medicine's bad, but he's saying what you need is, what you really need is you need to come from me. You, you need it to come from me. And so, yes, we should take advantage of the medical knowledge and advancements that we have. Jesus was not saying for them not to use the eye salve here, the eye ointment here. But what he was saying is we can't think that we are above anything else. We have to make sure that we are constantly embracing the medical things that God gives us, but while doing that, uh, uh, humbling ourselves before God and before Jesus Christ and saying, you're truly the one that we need to go to for this. You know, there's so many times things happen in the medical community, and, and one of the things that's amazing to me is when you talk to doctors and stuff is that they'll say how little we actually truly do know about the body, right? And we know a lot. We know a lot more than we have before in history. 
But we, there are so many things that we just don't even know. How many times is there a, 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 a diagnosis and the doctor's like, you know, I don't, I don't really know. I mean, you, many of you have experienced this personally. My family has experienced this personally where the doctor's kind of like, eh, I don't know. You know, I don't know. Because I think that's a good reminder to us that our hope is when what we need is Jesus Christ. We just sang the song, Lord, I need you, right? Uh, our hope and our righteousness, everything that we have for life and godliness is based on Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is what we need. He's saying, come buy for me. Get true riches for me. He says, I make the pure clothing that you need. The ointment that you need is something that only I can provide. And of course, he's talking spiritually here as well, but even in our physical stuff, we go to Christ as well. So, We can spend the rest of our time together just on this point here, but let me move on. So some healthy assurances from Jesus. First of all, he says, I am what he needs. But then he says this, I love you perfectly. Verse 19, I don't know if he's picked up on this. After he talks about what they need, he says, I counsel you to do this. He says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. He says, I love you perfectly. He tells them that he loves them, but then he tells them that he's going to uh, reprove them them, and he's going to bring discipline. And and so he says, so therefore, what you need to do is you need to repent. So even after giving him the harsh reality and showing them this harmful delusion that they were living living in, Jesus assures them of his love here. And it's a perfect love that he is willing to reprove and he is willing to discipline. And And it's a perfect love that calls us to zealousness and repentance. You see, a lot of times we look at love or, and this idea of love is saying, I'm going to affirm everything that, that you want me to affirm about you. And I'm going to encourage every part about you. And, and the point is, is that yes, we do need to be affirming. And yes, we do need to encourage. But true love, when we see someone doing something that is harmful to themselves or to someone else, we say, hey, don't do that. Right? Isn't that true love when we intervene? Isn't that what parents are supposed to do with children? Are we supposed to go to children and say, okay, you can't do that. You know, true love is not just letting the kids do whatever they want to do. And Jesus says, you know, true love is not for me just letting you do whatever you want to do. True love is for me to say, no, 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 this isn't helpful. Don't do this. And even bringing consequences and bringing uh, reproof in at times to, to guide us in the right direction here. He says, I love you. I love you perfectly. So I'm going to bring discipline. I'm going to bring reproof. But, you know, the lay of the sea, is, they, they didn't want that. I wonder if, if, if it's the same true about us at times where we just, we just don't want what God has for us. And when God does bring things into our life in difficulty, we're so quick to want to just change the circumstances to make it uh, uh, more pleasing to us that we miss maybe God directing us. Now again, please don't misunderstand my statement there. I'm not saying that every time something bad happens to you, God is disciplining you or correcting you. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that as believers in Christ, we should always be open to that possibility. And we should always be looking and say, God, what is it that, that you're working in my life? And what am I trying, what are you trying to teach me through this? I'm not saying it's a, it's, it's, it's a condemnation punishment necessarily, but it's a, it's a way of God uh, moving us and, and guiding us and shaping us to be more like Christ. So I wonder if we're so passionate about ease and, 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 and uh, the absence of difficulty that we miss the lessons along the way here and Jesus says, I love you perfectly, and part of my perfect love is I'm going to introduce difficulty into your life so that you can have, um, uh, uh, so that that you can make the decisions and and depend on me and understand that I am truly what you need. But not only does he do this, he says that, he says, um, I love you perfectly, and he says, I am what you need, but then he says, I am patiently calling. Of course, this is a very famous verse in verse 20. Behold, I I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. He's patiently calling. Now, This has been interpreted in a lot of different ways throughout the centuries. A lot of people look at this as like a salvation call where Jesus is knocking on the door of someone's heart and and saying, hey, I want to come in and I want to save you. And, uh, and a, lot of, a, a lot of good interpreters throughout the years have interpreted this text this way. There's, there's a lot more on the other side that say, well, no, this is, he's talking to a church and talking to people who are already believers, and, and, and they've, they've, they've gotten to the point where they're useless in the sense, and, and he's, he's calling them to repent and calling them back. And so this isn't about salvation. 
This is about restored fellowship that only repentance can bring. And, and, and I think that that's probably more so what is going on here. What he's saying here is he's, he's already called them to repent at the end of verse 19 you saw. And now, but he's already affirmed his love for them. And so it seems that there's already this, this, this relationship here. And, and the, the idea of disciplining we see in Hebrews is for something that, that God does for the people who are his children. And so it just seems that he's already talking to people who are, are, that they have a relationship, but for some reason they have closed the door, and for, in some ways they have closed the door of fellowship with him, and this is where they've become useless. They've become self-sufficient. So instead of going to Christ and saying, Christ, I need you, they have, have mitigated their life to the point where they feel like they've got everything organized and they don't need Christ anymore, and they've, they've, they've stopped praying and they've stopped depending on him. It seems like that's really what's happening here. It seems like... It, Instead of, of them going and, and praying like in the Lord's Prayer, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, right? I mean, we don't pray that way, right? Okay? None of us pray, okay, give us this day our daily bread, right? You know, we go, we go to Aldi and we go to Hy-Vee and we go to Target and we go to all the places and, and, and we say, okay, give us this day our monthly bread, right? Okay? And, and we get everything together and there's nothing wrong with that. But I wonder, I wonder if at times that <clears throat> we miss what Jesus was saying in that Lord's Prayer of give us this day our daily bread, Right? Uh, of, of every day saying, okay, I, I need you. I, I need you to provide for me. And again, I, I'm not saying now we as Christians we should restructure our grocery shopping that every day we go to the store and get what we need for that. That's not what I'm saying, of course. But I think you get the point. You get the point of just uh, internally and mentally and spiritually, are we saying, okay, every day I need Christ. When we wake up, is that something that we think about or is it something that uh, just maybe once a week we think about? You see, this is, this is what Jesus is saying he's knocking at the door, he's patiently calling, he's saying, hey, you know what, we had this fellowship, and at one time you knew that I was what you needed, and at one time you remember that I was, was using you to accomplish the plan, but you have grown so self-sufficient, you have marginalized me out of your life, and now I'm knocking, and I'm saying, I want this restored back, and I'm patiently calling you to repentance, and, and just think about the patience of God, that he is waiting Just think about how that he is, um, he's willing to knock on the door of his creation and say, I want fellowship with you. Just think about that. But we get so self-sufficient, we get so uh, um, uh, assured of our own power, of, of our own abilities, that Jesus there, he's saying, okay, all right, I'm here, I'm calling you to repentance. I bring a discipline, but you're ignoring it. So I just say, please, I, I, I beg of you, I beg of my own soul that we, we, we learn from the Laodicean church here. And we, we, we love the fact that we have a Savior who is wanting fellowship with us. And he's saying, he, I'm calling you to repentance here. And so he's patiently calling here. And what this does, though, is I think it really highlights the effects of sin. If, if we do not repent of our sin, it does break fellowship with Christ. You know, maybe, 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 maybe you're just going through the motions and, and, and maybe you come to church week after week or you watch online week after week and, and, and maybe you just feel this coldness, okay? I, I don't know what's going on in your life. I, I, I don't know for sure. I don't know the specifics. But, but if I could just be the voice piece of Jesus here and just say, repent, uh, uh, and, and go to Christ and say, God, I, I'm repenting of my coldness. I'm repenting of the fact that I'm drifting away from you. Hebrews chapter 2 says, beware lest we drift away. Can, can I just plead with you, my friends? Can I just plead with you to say, go back to Christ. You can understand that He is the one that we need, and He has everything in, 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 in our sin. When we do not confess our sin, when we, when we make excuses, uses for our sin and we hide our sin and we cover our sin and we do everything but repent of it, there's an effect here that is basically pushing Jesus out and slamming the door shut on him. And Jesus there, being the loving, gracious God that he is, says, okay, I'll knock on the door. I'll knock on the door. Now there's a time where he'll stop knocking. And please don't get to that point. Please don't get to that point. 
Jesus says, I I stand at the door and knock, and the effects of sin we have to take seriously. Just because we don't see an immediate effect of sin right away is, you know, we we think, okay, I'm okay. You know, I did this, and, and you know, nothing bad has happened. Just remember that the effects of sin are not always immediately seen. Sometimes, and I will, I will promise you this, it always affects other people. It always affects other people. It affects our church, it affects your home, it affects your job, it affects the community, it affects everything. And so Jesus here, he's saying, I'm calling you to repentance here. But then there's one other thing, is as he says, I am what you need, I love you perfectly, I'm patiently calling. And then he says this, I give good rewards. He says, the one, verse 21, well, first of all, he says, if anyone opens, op- hears my voice, opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. He says, we're going to have a fellowship meal together. We're going to have this restored because when people would eat together, there was a sign of unity. There was a sign of restoration. There was a sign of peace there. And this is what he's saying. We're going to have this. We're going to have this. And so in a minute here, we have a little uh, 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 a semblance of this that, will, uh, that points us to the eternal feast that we'll have with Christ. But, but here at the Lord's Supper, we're going to see this, this idea of that we can have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I, I, I give good, good rewards here. And he's talking about fellowship here and then also eternal reward. He says, to the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my Father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He says, yeah, repent, and it, 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 it's, it's only good things that happen after that. It's painful, it's difficult, there's humiliation at times of, of admitting when we're wrong. And everything. he says, but if you do that, it's only good stuff that happens after that. There's, there's fellowship that is sweeter than that you could ever imagine. And it is eternal reward that is better than I can describe. And so here we have this. Jesus says, I do this. I'm knocking at the door. You have grown so self-sufficient. It's been self-destructive to the point that it's, you've become useless. I've spewed you out of my mouth, but I've written you off. I've not written you off. I'm knocking at the door. Please repent. And when you open the door in repentance, and when you say, I am sorry, please forgive me, he says, I will come into that door, and I will sit down at the table of peace, and I will eat with you, and you will eat with me, and we will be friends. We will be more than friends. We will be family at the table together. Just repent. And so many times, we think repentance is something we do one time when we ask God to save us from our sins at one point, and then we move on from that. But the reality is, the life of a Christian is a life of repentance. And so we need to be repenters. And so I come back to where we started, that self-sufficiency is a self-destructive pursuit. Now, this seems counterintuitive to us. How can we know that this is true? Because we always want to be self-sufficient. How can we, how can we know, how can we be convinced that this is true? I go back to verse 14. The words of the Amen the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of God's creation. The amen here. This is a name of Jesus. Have you ever thought to consider that? So when we say at the end of our prayers, this is one of the reasons why historically we have said, in Jesus' name we pray, amen, okay? Amen isn't the sign-off call signal, okay? This is not like, you know, over and out to God in our prayers, okay? That's not why we say amen. Amen is actually a name of Jesus, and so it says, here is the amen. What is he talking about there, the amen? Well, what does amen mean? Amen means true or or faithful, and this is right. This is why some people would say amen during a sermon or, or, or listening to something or when I'm seeing it, I'll say, amen, God, because what I'm saying is this is true. I'm agreeing with this. And so what Jesus here, he's saying, he knows that this is counterintuitive, and he says, to, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness. And so if you believe the amen, you believe the faithful and true witness, we will be people quick to repent, and we'll be people that are, are motivated to follow Christ and put aside self-sufficiency. You see, the Laodicean mistake was to think that they had to be strong and self-sufficient. Jesus' objection here is that living that way, they will, that they will always lead, that, will, that, it, that if we live that way, it will always lead us away from Him and not closer to Him. It will cause us to settle for riches that will corrode away and for clothes that will wear out and for medicine that will truly not heal. 
He says, I'm calling you to me. Come to me. I counsel you. Come to me.